We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata here. Mike, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing all right. But how are you doing? I'm really just counting the regular season games remaining, to be completely honest with you. The other day I was like, how many quarters? How many quarters do we have still? We're going to get there. We're going to get to the finish line this weekend. We already had a recap show after the Steelers game, and it really felt like a, this is where we're at for the Cincinnati Bengals the rest of the season without Joe Burrow. It's not great. Uh, well, so, yeah, you said you're optimistic, and you actually had hope going into that game. I mean, my, my hope's been dead. When Burrow went down, I, it was done for me, you know? And so some fans have taken this a lot harder than others. I feel like the fans that thought Browning was going to go out there and beat the Steelers, they, they are having a rough time right now. You know, yeah, 100%. Other. I mean, we we knew this. Joe Burrow is a very special player. I've said it before. I think there were a lot of people when they look at Joe Burrow, they say, look, he has Jamar Chase. Look, he has T. Higgins. I know T. Higgins has been out the last few games with this hamstring injury. He has Tyler Boyd. He has Joe Mixon. He has all these weapons. He's good because he has those weapons. On Sunday, they showed you that, yes, T. Higgins wasn't out there, but Jamar Chase was out there. Tyler Boyd was out there. Joe Mixon was out there and a competent offensive line. And unfortunately, this offense just doesn't function without Joe Burrow. And one of the things we heard from Jake Browning in his press conference from last week was, you know, don't don't change up the playbook for me. And right now, I think that the Bengals offensive coordinator and Zach Taylor, Dan Pitcher, they're going to have to change the playbook for Jake Browning. Not going to work out without Joe Burrow. This is weird, though. Yeah, like the Ravens game, I felt like they kind of – babied it a little bit and then this past game there were times where it was just like yeah we're gonna go empty run half field concept here half field concept here good luck and he would read the wrong side and once you read the wrong side when it's both quick game you're just done and so he tried to throw the ball and almost gets picked off it's like give the guy some help here <laughs> like let's not give it you know he's he's a I think a lot of people have made the comparison, but it's like you're a freshman in college and you just got dropped into a PhD level quarterbacking offense. And maybe let's dial that back and let's, I know the run game wasn't working. I think they could have made more of an effort to run the ball, but it wasn't working. So you get kind of screwed there, but at the same time, they have to find a way to make it easy on him. Otherwise every week's going to look like that. Every week's going to look like Browning did this past week if they don't make it easier on him. You can tell that Joe Burrow is just so good at his football IQ of reading the defense because at times you would have – I don't know how you watched it, but I watched it like oh, Joe Burrow would have thrown that ball. Joe Burrow would have thrown either for the touchdown. Joe Burrow would have thrown for the first down. And it just – it's just a different kind of quarterback with Jake Browning out there, and that's not breaking any news right now. But – when you went back and you watched the tape, I think if people looked at the box score and they didn't watch the game, they'd be like, oh, Jake Browning, not a bad first NFL start. But when you go back and watch the tape, it felt like there were so many almost interceptions, almost a pick six. It looked pretty brutal for Jake Browning in his first start. And for me personally, felt like at times he was holding on to the ball just a little too long. Sure was. Uh, and it's weird because they gave him a lot of quick game too. And you can't hold on to the ball in quick game. He got it out plenty as well, but it, it just, yeah, held on to the ball too long, took sacks because of that. And he seemed fairly oblivious to what was going on in terms of pass rush. He wasn't just making a small movement by a little time, throw the ball. It would either be, he didn't see that coming or arguably the worst one, which he did multiple times, which would be, move out of the way of that and then drop his eyes, try to find somewhere to run, not find anywhere to go. And now you can't throw the ball. You can't run the ball and you're just done. You're toast. Not friendly to the offensive line in this game. Um, and I think PFF charted Jonah with two sacks. And I mean, one of them was an unblocked guy. And to me, I thought that was sample, but who knows? You know, I guess only the staff is going to actually know the answer to that. It was a miscommunication, but the other one, I mean, what was it, five seconds before Watt got him? And heck of a play from Watt to beat two guys on the play and get there and everything. But, I mean, come on. And Browning turned down a, uh, an explosive play on that one, didn't throw it because he didn't see what was happening. It felt like also on that play, I'm not going to say it was the easiest read, but I also feel like they ran that play specifically thinking 
that the safety was going to come help on Jamar and that would give him the open, open deep corner. And he didn't even look at it. He went, he kind of read it like, ah, oh, they're too high. So I'm not gonna be able to throw that deep corner. Well, they're, they're faking that they're faking that. And it's, it's a bracket on Jamar. <laughs> they're trying to get two guys on Jamar chase. So he went to look at Jamar chase like oh, Jamar's is covered. Well, that means the sa- the, my safety valve is open. No. And we max protected. So, you know, only three guys in the passing pattern. Okay, now you're done. Well, it's it's tough. It's tough. And if they're going to be competitive on Monday, and you hope they are for a few reasons. One, so it's enjoyable to watch. And two, so you don't get absolutely embarrassed on an island Monday night football game. They're going to need to be able to run the ball. They're going to need to be able to work easy stuff for Browning when off of those plays and they credit to them. They were able to do it a little bit in that first half, like the drew sample touchdown, easy, easy play. You know, you fake the run turn around. Nobody even covered sample. You flip it out to him. He runs it in for a touchdown. You're going to need a lot of that. You're going to need a lot and get a little bit creative with getting the ball to some of your guys in space. And the one thing I like is that they didn't put the RPOs on his plate. He was just straight handing that ball off on run plays. And I think that helps the offensive line a little bit as well. It's just, yeah, you got to find a way to be able to run the ball a little bit, at least be able to put him ahead of the chains and not try to play third and nine, third and eight, second and 10, second and seven, second and eight type situations where, yeah, they're probably throwing here. Well, I guess second and seven you could run, but still, you could actually run out of any of those situations if you really wanted to, but the staff doesn't have that philosophy, uh, even with Jake Brown. So, yeah, let's simplify what he has to do. You can't scrap the entire playbook and just pick up a different playbook and try to run it. I mean, that's, that's not how this works. You know, even if these guys are professionals, they didn't learn that playbook. <laughs> So they have to be able to keep it within the confines of their offense, but there's stuff in the offense that they can do to try to make it easier on him. They let Browning have his chance at trying to not change the offense. And now you're not so much changing the entire identity of the team or the scheme or whatever, but we're going to get to all the easy buttons that we have in this offense, which to be fair with Burrow, not a ton. Like that is something that's like Burrow usually – has to he's not playing out of structure or anything he's not just playing hero ball i hear that a lot but he has to operate at a high level and when your quarterback's not operating at a high level this office doesn't work that well it's it's essentially like when peyton manning would go down and if jim sorgi came in jim sorgi doesn't look good (laughs) and curtis painter doesn't look good when he came in when manning hurt his neck because the offense that they are requiring that quarterback to run is a very high level offense. And it's not something that you can just toss like a Nick Mullins into. Yeah. I think, you know, the biggest thing right now is you have six games left. This team isn't out of the playoffs, which sounds absolutely wild to think about. Even if they would have won that game versus the Steelers, the Steelers, I have no clue how they have the record they do. I truly don't. It, I mean, I guess you can feel good about getting that win, but that was an ugly win on both sides for me personally, watching that football game. It was definitely an AFC North type of game, but it just felt like if Joe Burrow was out there, they win maybe by a couple scores. Um, and it's just really unfortunate because that it would just, it just, it's hard to watch. Um, but offensively, one of the things I want to see, I know there's a lot of pressure, or at least it feels like there's a lot of pressure on Will Zach Taylor, Brian Callahan, Dan Pitcher kind of figure out to be creative with this offense? Will they figure out a run game? Because when Joe Burrow does return next year, you need to be able to run the ball. I know Joe Burrow likes to throw the ball. I know Zach Taylor likes to throw the ball. All that is fine because you have a quarterback like Joe Burrow, but you also need to protect him too, and you need to balance out your offense a little bit. I'm hoping in these next six games, I know I'm not sure about the future of Joe Mixon if he's on the team next year or or you know to figure something out, and, and he is back, and, and maybe Chase Brown works. But I want to see what Chase Brown can do. Chase Brown was healthy. They said before the hamstring injury for Chase Brown, and he went on the short-term IR, that he was going to ramp up. They were feeling really good about his practices, and he was going to be involved with this offense. Brian Callahan said this past week that they had plays for him, but they couldn't work them in. 
at some point, you're going to have to work those in because you need to see what you have in Chase Brown when it comes to running back number two or just a running back in general on this offense. If you're getting guys like Miles Murphy, DJ Turner definitely had to be out there because obviously you're dealing with the Cam Taylor Brett injury. You get Jordan Battle, who's starting at the safety position. A lot of your other rookies, you're not afraid to throw in there. Charlie Jones and Yoshi, I'd like to see a little more with the wide receiver group. You've got to do the same thing with him. And unfortunately, th- there was nothing for Chase Brown. And, and look, I'm not saying it's going to be easier against this Jags defense. They can stop the run. But overall, I want to see what you can do in the run game. It's 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 kind of terrifying that they don't have one right now. And I think we collectively get a little bit of goldfish brain, too, where <laughs> the running game was so bad that I think now the conversation is like, this is the worst run game I've ever seen. I still remember last week against the Ravens, and it was a long time ago. We're, we're almost two weeks ago at this point. But they ran the ball pretty well to start that game. And they did. The run game is built, in my opinion, personnel-wise especially, to face light boxes because you're going to face light boxes when you have Joe Burrow. If they were going to be a team that can pound – other teams, when they even try to go heavy boxes like the Steelers did, they would have more than one tight end that can block. They would have wide receivers that can get into the run game and block. They don't have that. They have one tight end that can block. They have three tight ends that are road blocks mm-hmm. on good road, sorry, speed bumps on good days, and one tight end that can block. You can't pound teams into submission if you go six eligible blockers. Not eligible, sorry, but, you know, six guys that can block, six guys that are blocking on this play. Well, the defense has four, let's say four linemen, two linebackers. So six on six, you're fine. They're dropping the safety down, six on seven. Now what's the move? I don't know. And I think there's some ways you could go about it. One of them maybe is they did it with Finley before, so it's possible. But trying to get to, like, some of that – option stuff some of that stuff where let's you know browning can run let's just option the end and now it's six on six again and you're reading the end but i don't know like th- there is a point where they aren't built to do that they aren't built to pound the rock here and even if they i think there were a couple plays where they were just one block away from getting joe mixon one-on-one with the safety so far this year, Joe Mix is probably not making that safety miss. He'll probably run him over, fall forward, pick up extra yards that way, but he's probably not making that guy miss. I didn't see that a lot from Brown in college to make a guy miss like that. I think he was more of a guy, if you can get it blocked up right, he's got home run capabilities. He's got good vision. He can set up his blocks, tempo them. This all sounds great for when there's no safety in this and you block everything up and you're not getting touched for the next 10 yards. When you're getting touched – four yards downfield that doesn't sound as great but maybe he can make a miss maybe maybe you throw him out there and he is able to make him miss i don't know but that is the thing that's tough about what you're supposed to do here is just i a lot of times think like yeah on paper maybe that doesn't work but it could work because of this when i'm looking at the personnel for this team i don't see a lot of ways that they can try to pound the rock they're just not built to do it they even the offensive line most of those guys are better pass protectors than they are run blockers. Even if the run blocking as a whole has been fine on the year, that's usually when they get to face teams that don't think that are trying to protect against the pass, protect against the deep ball, not against teams that are going to sell out to stop the run because Jake Brown is that quarterback. So you're telling me Chase Brown is not going to get reps. <laughs> that has a long way. I just want to talk about the run game. Um, no, I mean, I don't see it. Do you? I mean, I- I don't over I don't, or under four snaps. Over. Oh, okay. I think th- th- I think you've just got to try it. You eight just got to. No, no, no. Under. Oh, okay. Somewhere under between four to eight. <laughs> yeah, I'm under on that. So I just you're. It just feels like a. I, I I'm not, and I'll say this right now because I know it's out there. And anytime your team is losing and your franchise quarterback is out, all the heat is going to be on your head coach Zach Taylor. It really is. And I, and I get the criticism when it comes with some of the offense and, and then Brian Callahan. But for me personally, I just want them to 
it's every team, if, if Patrick Mahomes is not out there, Andy Reid and his offense, they're going to struggle. If you look at a lot of the teams in the NFL without their franchise quarterback, they're going to struggle offensively. I hope this is kind of just an, a, not like a learning experience. People are going to be like, okay, we're over that. What year is it for Zach Taylor now? But for me, I'm not on the get him out of here. You got to fire the head coach. You got to get No, that's kind of insane. It's just, for me, it is. Because I think Joe Goodberry, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, um, I, I'm going off a real quick glance at what he had tweeted of what Zach Taylor's been able to do while here. And, and you know, you can even include the postseason. Um, I'm I'm not down on him. It's it's easy for us to look at this offense right now and criticize Zach Taylor when things aren't going right. You can look up every offensive coordinator around the NFL and you could search their name after a loss. And you better believe every fan base is criticizing the offensive coordinator. Their offensive coordinator just happens to be Ryan Callahan and Zach Taylor because Zach Taylor's calling the plays. So, you know, he gets it there. But for me personally, I'm just not there. I know it. we're going to hear it this whole entire six game stretch going into the off season until Joe Burrow's back on the field. But what can you tell fans who are feeling this way right now? Okay. One, it's a fruitless endeavor because it's like, Taylor's not getting fired. No, he's not. He's not. <laughs> That's the funniest part. It's like, you could yell all you want, but a Burrow likes him. Yep. That's probably your biggest thing. Mm -hmm. B, he, they've they went to a Super Bowl pretty recently, two years ago. They went to a Super Bowl. The Bengals let Marvin Lewis stay for a million years for making it to the wild card game every once in a while. I I don't see this as an ownership that's going to do that without like the quarterback having an issue and you know like it's me or him type situation because then it's always the quarterback if he's yeah if he's good, but. I would say that this was a top five offense last year. This is a team that went to a Super Bowl. This is a team that went to an AFC championship game. And this doesn't happen in spite of a coach to me. Mm -hmm. And some people say Burrow hero ball. Burrow mostly plays in structure. I think that's the thing with like Josh Allen. And when people get excited about, about oh man, Joe Brady's got that offense cooking. When I was watching that game, it was a lot of Josh Allen out of structure. It was you see the quarterback roll out and make plays like that. You, you see that with Burrow, but a majority of the time he's throwing from the pocket. He can escape the pocket. He can get out there and create. And that's perfect because there are defenses that get called that just, they've got you. That defense was the correct call for whatever the offense was running. Now you have to go create and he can do that. But a majority of the time he's throwing from the pocket. He's playing within the structure of Zach Taylor's offense. I'm not saying that Zach Taylor is the greatest coach of all time. No. I don't think that he, I don't think he's top five. I mean, look at the Super Bowl winners, John Harbaugh, Mike Tomlin, not to mention Andy Reid, Bill Belichick, and all these other guys, you know, like guys yeah. that are going to go down in history. And some of them, if not all those guys, make the Hall of Fame. But you're looking at this, and some people think like he's a bottom three coach or something. I don't see it. Here's the fun part where you talked about those guys aren't good without their quarterbacks. Everybody talks about Mike McDaniel, right? Like Mike McDaniel, he, he schemes guys wide open. You know, the Mike McDaniel offense, you could fit anybody into that. Last year, two a missed three games from a concussion against the Bengals, weirdly enough. How many points per game did the Dolphins score in those three games? 16. Wow. <laughs> And then, okay, the Ravens. Well, they went three and two without Lamar last year. They were great. They made the playoffs despite losing Lamar. How many points per game did the Ravens score when Tyler Huntley was quarterback? 12. 12 points per game without Lamar. They won because of the defense. The defense yeah. was allowing like three points in a game or eight, 10 points in a game, and they'd win that one 13 to 10. They were not winning as like, oh, the Ravens offense didn't miss a beat. They just dropped in Snoop Huntley, and I know he went to a Pro Bowl somehow. <laughs> that that was crazy, but we saw their offense in back-to-back -back weeks. We can both agree it wasn't good. No, and, and even that playoff game, it's like they were competitive. The defense stopped the Bengals' offense. Like, that's why they were competitive. It wasn't like a shootout with, with Huntley. I thought Huntley had his best game, probably. And mm -hmm. that's his best game. 
<laughs> if and you still yeah. fumbled the ball. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a big one. Uh, but um, that's a big swing. It's a twelve point swing. Um, yeah. So I look at that, and then I look at the Dolphins one. It's like, oh, so you can't just drop in a new quarterback. They went out and they signed Mike White to an extent to like a contract this year. If if you could really just throw anybody in there, why would they bother? Why wouldn't they just roll with Skylar Thompson? Yep. It's just there's one guy that can make any quarterback work. And it's Kyle Shanahan. And to me, the reason for that is the offense flows around the quarterback. And the quarterback is a cog in the machine. When you're looking at the Chiefs, and I know Chad Henney went in there and had a drive. and It was a good drive. It was a good drive. But when you look at the Chiefs, when you look at the Ravens, when you look at the Bills, when you look at the Jaguars, they're going to play this week. When you look at... The Eagles, they were worse with Minshew, much worse with Minshew than they were with Hertz. When yeah. you look at all these teams with really high end quarterbacks, when that court that quarterback is the machine, he's not a cog in the machine. Everything else works around him. The offense flows through the quarterback rather than around the quarterback. I know some people want the Shanahan offense, but it's like, do you want to take Peyton Manning out of the offense he wants to be in to go be Jake Plummer because the Denver Broncos scored a lot of points this year. No. no. And I don't think Burrow would a thrive in some type of under center heavy play action offense, because that's been the worst part of his game his entire time in Cincinnati. And B I don't think that that offense is the only way to score points. The Bengals scored more points per game last year than the 49ers did. And this year it's not true, but last year it is. Last year they were a the fourth best offense by DVOA, fifth best in EPA per play. I believe it was seventh most points. It's just this offense is certifiably effective. It's good. It's a good offense. I feel like, and you can say if, if this is out there, I almost feel like there's like a red zoneification of like how people view things where the dolphins pop up on your screen and it's a wide open touchdown and you go, man, I wish we had that. The Vikings get a wide open Justin Jefferson. You go, man, I wish we had that. But that's all you see. Like you don't see all of the failed plays to get there. And, and believe me, I'll add speed every day when you have a guy like Tyreek yeah, Hill. Yeah, this team but... needs speed in the offseason. I'm all about it. But but I agree with you. I I, I think we I, it, it's fine. I'm not telling people how they should be a fan or how they should look at the Cincinnati Bengals. You're always going to look at it the way you want to look at it. But for me personally, I'm not on board. I'm not I'm not there. I'm not a get rid of Zach Taylor. Get rid of no, Ryan it's Kelly. Just, it's just insane to me. To yeah. And then. Let me ask you this, not to go too far into what the offseason is going to look like, because we have six games to look forward to. And I actually want to go back to the defense, too, in this game. But speaking of coaches, I think there's another guy that's very easy to bring up because he's the run game coordinator and he's the offensive line coach for Frank Pollock. Do you have any criticisms? Or are you kind of in a similar boat when you think of this is an offense without Joe Burrow right now? One, yeah. I feel like the issue is more personnel based than it is scheme or anything. I think one, on, on one hand, I think there's stuff to criticize Frank Pollock for. I think that, you know, the stuff he does get criticized for the most is stuff that I don't really put on him. I mean, let's think about it. One, he gets criticized a lot. Who has he developed? Who has he had? The yeah. He had Jackson Carmen, who they went over his head to pick. And you could tell, like, you're not calling the all the old offensive line coach and doing all this other crap if Frank Pollock is bought in and trying to sell you on Jackson Carmen. That wasn't his guy. That was a front office decision. So he had to work with a talent that nobody else saw as a second round pick. That's the best thing he's had. Okay. Jonah has turned into a solid offensive tackle in his best years under Pollock. Even you Look, Cordell Volson was an FCS guy who didn't have to pass protect ever and got switched into that offense. I thought the jump he made from what he was doing at the FCS to the NFL was massive. Okay. And and he showed that he could play a little bit. Now, can he be upgraded on? Sure. But I also think like that's the best that you've given the guy. Look across the league. I think that Bill Callahan, like you probably think, is the best offensive line coach in the league. They could have had him too. They drafted a guy in the top, what, 12 
And he hasn't really done anything better than Jonah Williams. And he has more tools and traits. Okay, so the second best guy, Jeff Stoutland. That's probably your second best offensive line coach in the league. Andre Dillard was a first-round pick, and he is off the team. He didn't get a fifth year. He got replaced by a sixth-round guy. So, yes, those guys have taken some people like Jordan Mailata and – Oh man, why was it blanking on what Bill Callahan's been able to like Wyatt Teller was the Bills trash that they sent over. Like he's able to take those guys and turn them into great players. But the thing is that they actually make a real investment on the offensive line as well. You could see what Joel Batonio and Jack Conklin and Jedrick Wills, who's the guy I was mentioning. I think all those guys are first or second round picks. You look at what Jeff Statlin's working with. Lane Johnson, first round pick. Travis or Jason Kelsey was developed before he got there. Mm -hmm. And then left tackle, that's him. He made that work. Landon Dickerson, second round pick, right before the Bengals. Even Andy Heck in uh, Kansas City. I mean, that one you could look at. Creed Humphrey, third round pick. Trey Smith, sixth round pick. So maybe you try to make the case there. But there's – come on. We knew Trey Smith didn't fall for <laughs> – like the, if the Bengals draft Trey Smith, he might be good here. So I think on one hand, yes, he has not taken the day three guys and developed them into anything. But on the other hand, day three guys mostly don't pan out. Like you need real talent. You need a first round pick if you're going to have some good offensive line. They've been able to manage a fine offensive line by trying to go to free agency and sign everybody they can which is fine, but that's how you end up with a top five paid offensive line that's not play paying, that's not playing like it. It's because while you're signing fine players, it's just those guys add up. You sign the right guard, the center, the left tackle, sign them all in free agency. I didn't think any of those guys were top three at their position or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think that the center got a deal that was essentially like fringe starter. The right guard got average starter money and the left tackle got good left tackle money that's what most of them have played like unless you i mean Orlando Brown about the injury has been a little down but other than that i don't know that's just my whole thing is just like make an effort make an effort to draft an offensive lineman that's not jackson carmen like take somebody who they should take in an early round and i mean frank might get fired this offseason but that would be my test. It would be, you could stay this next year and we're going to get whoever you want. Mm -hmm. And if he comes out and he flames out in that first year, okay, that's it. Like we can't trust you to develop guys. Like that was the guy you handpicked, but he hasn't had that shot yet. <laughs> like he the guys he had, the guys he's had to develop are just all like afterburner thoughts. He hasn't had a say in the majority of, of those picks. So, I mean, even you could probably even point to the signing. So I agree with you. If Frank Pollock gets one more year as a run game coordinator and the offensive line, and maybe they bring in and someone run, else. And run game coordinator isn't play caller, by the way. He's not the no. one that's saying run the ball eight times this game. He designs what the run, what runs are going to have. I think these are fine, solid designs. They're what a team should do with this talent. They're not performing. You could put that on him. I think yeah. that's acceptable. But he's not out there going like, ah, I got eight run plays for today, you know, no. and you got to work around that. Or Zach Taylor isn't handing the headset over and be like, all right, Frank, we're going to run the ball here. Why don't you call this play? Taylor's calling the plays. Yeah. And and maybe they decide, hey, you know what? We're going to do something else with run game coordinator, but you're going to be the offensive line coach, you know, the, to be determined on what that looks like. And maybe Frank Pollock says, no, I, I've had enough. We'll see. There's still a lot of football left to be played. I feel like every single one of these coaches will be there till the end of this regular season. And Zach Taylor will be back next year. The only reason I don't think Brian Callahan will be is if he gets a head coaching job. But we'll see That's what happens. with the way the team went. Not the way this offense is going. And you could say the same for what I'm about to get to now, the defense. I don't think uh, people are going to be calling Lou this offseason to come and be the head coach. Um, no. Not that Lou doesn't have the resume. He definitely does. But his defense has definitely, and I know a lot of people want to point to the offense as a reason why the defense is struggling, but the defense has struggled pretty much all season long. Um, you know, you can look at these games and say, oh, they only gave up 16 to the Steelers, or they only did this, or they gave up this amount of yards, but they still won this football game. Um, they've struggled. They've struggled a lot. Um, and these next six games, the big thing for me personally is 
look, yes, I've said it before. They're still in the playoff hunt, all that stuff. I'm not really looking at any of that. I'm looking at what are these younger guys going to look like on the defensive side of the ball? You look at your young secondary camp. Taylor Britt should be back for this next game against the Jags. You get DJ Turner out there. You have Jordan Battle out there. You have Dax Hill out there, um, you know, to be determined on what all of that looks like together. If you get to do that for six games, that's going to be absolutely huge for them in the future. Miles Murphy, the few opportunities he's getting out there, he is making a difference. You're a guy. You said My it. Guy. My guy. My guy. I stood there through the preseason hate. <laughs> I mean, the patience and, and letting people know, putting an article out there and letting them know, hey, hey, believe in this guy, what he's going to be able to do. And I think that's going to be absolutely huge for him in the next six games. Guess how many snaps Joseph Asai had in that game? Zero. I already know. That is insane to me. But his job is just, I mean, what they were doing was splitting him and Murphy, and I think they finally went, Murphy's playing better. It's also a little weird, though, because Joseph Asai just had his best game against the Ravens, and then they just cut him down to zero. But I don't know. Like He was my breakout guy coming into this year. He hasn't Same. delivered on that promise at all. I think you could look at it as, well, what are our options here? We keep giving snaps to Osai, who hasn't done anything with him. them. They're not going to extend him. They're not going to extend him. Or do we just give all of his snaps to Murphy, and now we get Murphy up to 20 snaps this game? I think that's their answer. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to give those snaps to Murphy, let Murphy develop, and he made real good on those yeah. 20 snaps, nine pass rush attempts, and I had four clean wins. Three of those pressures, one of them I think the ball got out too quick for it to be counted as a pressure, even though he was running clean at the quarterback. Um, that's insane. <laughs> for nearing 50% win rate for what I was watching on the pass rush, that's that's crazy. And it's a small sample, whatever. He showed the ability to string some moves together. Oh, I was so excited. I was so I was jumping out of my chair on that on that sack. Because that, that's what I care about right now. Mm -hmm. I, I In that game, I had no care about whether or not the Bengals won. And I don't care if that makes me a, a bad whatever. No, it doesn't actually. Because it's Malik neighbor season. So it's good. It, it's any blue chip talent. See, I don't know any of these guys. I don't know. Martin okay. Harrison Jr. falls there. I think you take him. Uh, For beat right now. Uh, but uh, no, no. I, I think it's it's awesome to see that out of Miles Murphy. And I agree with you. I think when you go into that game, I'll be completely honest with you. Went to the game and I thought... If they lose, it's I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be upset. I just want to see you know more out of this team going down this stretch in the next. That was seven games. Now we're at six games, and maybe we'll see that with Miles Murphy. And, and I'm gonna be on board. Let me see all the rookies out there. And look, NFL drafts are really, really, really hard to hit. I feel very optimistic. I know it is extremely early to feel optimistic, and this team only has five wins on the season. But DJ Turner is fun to watch. Jordan Battle was the highest rated DB rookie DB this past week. Um, you know, it wasn't 80%, but it was around 78%. That's absolutely huge. If he's going to start being the starter alongside Dak he took Hill. on wide receiver blocks. He won those wide receiver blocks. Still haven't seen him tested in coverage too much, but that uh, is what it is. Yeah. Obviously. So there, there's a little optimism there and you get that with Dax Hill, which is he's still learning Dax Hill out there. It's still a very young secondary, something that a lot of people were concerned with, with this defense. There's still things to work on for me personally, the linebacker situation is kind of bumming me out right now. Yeah, me too. I don't I don't get it. Um I think some of it is that they don't always get the best play in front of them and now you don't have guys like Bates and Bell behind them. But I also feel like they're just both of them are just not playing up to the standard you expect and it feels really weird that I don't know. Like, I'm glad you mentioned this because I don't think a lot of people have talked about it. Like, that's a big reason this defense hasn't worked out very well so far. Like, the two linebackers that were great last year and great the year before mm -hmm. are playing poor. And what do you do about that? I mean, you could look at Logan Wilson giving up explosive plays, Jermaine Pratt not able to shed off of his blocks and coming down when he makes a run through, not making a tackle. Instead, the guy just runs away from him. What what where where do you go? What is the move here? Because it's it seems like it's them not just not playing up to their standard. Now you've paid them both, and I don't think this is like a they're paid, they're not trying. I think it's just like a this is strange. This is this is strange that they're not playing at least pretty good. Like they were good last year, 
can't they at least like if they're gonna take a step back, can't it be like a little step back? It's like a more big step back. I don't know. That's frustrating though, and that's one of those things where something to watch for next year because those are your two linebackers next year. Maybe you get better play in front of them. Maybe you better play behind them, and that just makes it better. And they are able to play up to what the standard that we expect. But as of now, it is a slight concern heading into next year and a big disappointment for this year. Yeah, 100%. I think it's it's fair to look at the offensive struggles for this team right now with or without Joe Burrow and then point to the defense and say the defense hasn't been good enough. And that has been one of the biggest shockers for me because I thought after – I think actually going back to the Rams game, I thought, okay, defense is back. The defense is back. It's it's I, They can do it. They can stop a, a pretty good offense and what the Rams had with Matthew Stafford and the rookie wide receiver out there. But they've just, for me personally, they've been a letdown in a lot of games. Um, you know, even in that Ravens game week two, I, I know Joe was kind of feeling a little more like himself in the second half. So the offense was getting something going. I know he threw the interception and that kind of changes the game. But defensively, they needed to make one more stop on Lamar to you know at least have one more shot. And they couldn't do it. And he had one of his best games of the season against them. And that was what Wilson as the spy committing too hard at the start and giving up the run. Yeah, it's there's a lot to look at. And it's it's some of these veteran guys. Um, while it can be really exciting when you look at the rookies and, you know, what does Dax Hill look like going into his true year two next year? Um, that's going to be really telling. But there's still a lot on this defense that you, you want to see more from, um, from guys that are veterans. And Mike um, Hilton's. Seems like he's taking a step back. And yeah. I don't know. Sam Hubbard, this game, it was bad. And my reaction was I think he came back too early more than anything. Cause I don't think he's, I mean, I don't think he's taken much of a step back this year. I feel like he's been a fine run, run stopping defensive end for the most part. And Trey Hendrickson's obviously having a good year. He's up at double digit stacks already. He might be having a better year than last year. Yeah. But yeah, when you get like, Hilton's taken a minor step back. Cheeto hasn't been able to find his footing and all around. It's just, you're not getting, we were thinking like if they get a little bit worse safety play, this defense should still be good, but that's mm -hmm. not all that's happened. They've gotten a little bit worse safety play and then they've gotten worse play from guys that they expected that we and they expected to play at the same level that they were playing at before, but the linebackers playing worse, your nickel corners playing worse that the the interior of this defensive line outside of the top two guys is I mean I hate watching it every single week on replay it's just that how are you a team that plays three defensive tackles when you get into base and then you're you're putting I mean like Zach Carter's just he hasn't been able to play he should How's, not be on the field he's he's at like 40 snaps last week if I am a team that wants to play against this defense, this is not a Lou Anarumo scheme thing that I need to figure out. I would literally go up there in my base package, make them get into base. So Carter comes on the field or Tupo. Tupo's taken a step back this year too. I thought he was a fine depth piece last year and the year mm -hmm. before, but now he's gone to, that's not a guy that I want to play. Tufele isn't like people scream for it. He, he's also a bad, he hasn't done anything either. And he's been bad. So anybody they have as their defensive line rotation after Reader and Hill has been a negative. I would go out there. I would see which – okay, what they're going to do is they're put Reader over the center. They're going to have Hill on one side and Carter Tupo Tufele on the other. I would find the Carter Tupo Tufele, and I would run right at him. And that's kind of what the Steelers did a lot of this game too. They just ran right at it. They were like, okay, we'll get some movement here, and it'll, it'll open this up for us. That's I mean tough. – you look at this interior and you're like, we've talked a lot about, you know, if this season doesn't go as planned, they are probably picking in the top 10, honestly could be picking in the top eight, the way this is going. Um, if not higher. That's why you say this way you say neighbors. And I'm like, man, there's, there's a lot of ways I could go. Like, you yeah, could go I could go wide receiver. You could go with the Newton guy, the interior defensive lineman. You could go with an offensive tackle because when else are you going to have a shot to pick yep. one of the top, if it's one of the top two guys that fall, like, that that are there. When are you? When else are you gonna ever have a shot to get an Olu Fontenu or Joe Alt? Like, they have a chance to really add a talent that they're not gonna probably have this shot any other time. Like Joe Burrow is too good for you to be picking in the top eight, even really the top ten. You're probably gonna be picking in the twenties until Joe Burrow retires. So, so this is this is one of your shots to let's add a cheap 
young, very high end talent. Just like when they added Jamar Chase. Yeah, that's I, that's the reason that like I don't think you want to tank from an organizational level. But it's why as fans you shouldn't care if this team wins. Oh, I think a lot of fans after that Steelers game are like, okay, what is the draft board? Should have been like? there before, is what I'm saying. <laughs> you, you're right. You're right. I was kind of a little optimistic. Like, who, maybe they can play spoiler against someone. And right now, I do not see that happening. Uh, but for me, yeah, I feel like you can't go wrong if you look at that. Just all the talent in the top 10, top 15. And this yeah. is a loaded wide receiver class. For T. Higgins, look, his season's not really going as planned. Um, he could be back for this Jags game. You could come and come up with a contract for him to be like, look, this is what you are worth this past year. This is what you were worth over the last few years. This is the money we're going to put on the table. Or you tag and trade him and maybe you get a second. I, I am actually of the mind of I'm not against a tag and trade, but I would need a first because – You can get a first? I don't know if you can or not. Okay. That's what I would do. Okay. Because you're going to get a, you're going to get a third – for a yep. comp pick, I'm tagging him no matter what. Like, I've heard the Jonah idea. Okay, I was maybe Jonah's biggest defender this offseason. Yeah, I'm not about it anymore. I'm, I'm not tagging Jonah over tagging T. I mean, no. come on, guys. Like, you were arguing with me that Jonah wasn't even playable. <laughs> like, yeah. come on, he's a fine, solid tackle. And now it's like, oh, yeah, let's tag him. It's like, he's a fine, solid tackle. <laughs> no, you get but, more out of a guy like T. If you but tag I, I, and I don't know if the Bengals would be in on this, but maybe you just push the chips in for 24. You've got the cap space to be able to tag T. You add in a top eight draft pick or 10, whatever they end up getting. You add in a high second round pick, which is essentially what Murphy was this past year, what Dax yeah. Hill was this, the year before. Imagine that, you know, they get a Landon Dickerson type at the top of round two or something like that. You add in all this talent to this team, you're going to lose talent too. So, like, yeah. it's not fair to just say, like, that's what's going to happen. You keep everybody. But I'm kind of of the mind of, like, is it worth a second round pick to, like, where's, where, where do you make the distinction of the window is not a visual medium, except for those watching on YouTube? Which I think most of us, most of the people listen. Anyway, do it with my hands. The window, like, where, it's wide open and you tag T it stays there. In my opinion, if you tag and trade T it's probably going to close a little bit mm -hmm. because that second rounder is not going to give you what T gives you. I think a first rounder that, you know, it's going to close a I little, know. but I, I'd, I'd, I'd be in because that's like, okay, we're not getting a long-term deal done here, but yeah, I don't know. Like I, I think going one more year with T and like, yeah, you miss a full round of draft value. If you don't take that second rounder or you don't because maybe he has a really great season and you're in the same position the following year and yeah. he's played a full healthy season and you're like good receiver, really young still. And a lot of people want to see proven talent. So maybe this will benefit T Higgins too. I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. It's obviously going to be a topic of conversation for months to come with the wide receiver room. I'd like to mm -hmm. call this a soft rebuild, very soft. Very light. And they're a good spot for it, though, because they were going to have to do this no matter what after this year. This was kind of the last year of the Burrow rookie deal, the T rookie deal. The Chase rookie deal ends next year, and it's probably going to get extended this offseason. So this soft rebuild kind of had to happen no matter what. Yeah. But now you're in a better spot for it, and maybe that accelerates it. That's what a lot of rival fans – I was listening to some of them talk, the Kansas City Chiefs and even Philly fans. They're like, this is actually – Great for Cincinnati because they're going to get one of those top receivers or offensive linemen, and they're going to and they're going to be picking late in the draft. But believe me, I would sign up for picking thirty-two every single year. Um, and unfortunately, that's not going to happen this year. Sorry to break anybody's hold. Um, if you had high expectations for going to the Super Bowl for the Cincinnati Bengals, I just don't see that happening. With Jake Browning, like, no, I don't know. And the way this defense is struggling right now. Yeah, the defense is a big issue. We talked a lot about it. I think no matter what, they've got to find defensive tackle bodies. Mm -hmm. They, for the past couple of years, so when they signed Joby and then Hill caught on, like that was what? That was the best this defense was able to play. And then they let Joby go. They draft a guy in the third round, and it didn't pan out. And it just feels like, well, that was our plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's like, well, why don't we why don't we try to get another Oga Joby in here? Why don't we try to get another body? Because really, to me, you need for this defense, this Lou Anarumo style defense, you need three quality defensive tackles. And then if Carter's your fourth guy coming in for 10 snaps, eight snaps, that's fine. When he's out there for 35 snaps, no. That mm-hmm. is that is a liability on the field that other teams are taking advantage of. Who knew we'd go a little long when there's really not a whole lot to talk about when you think about the game, but offensive, defensively, when you're without Joe Burrow, there is plenty to break down with the Cincinnati Bengals team. Obviously, we'll look ahead to the Monday Night Football game when we record on Thursday evening. One quick update everybody already knows if you're listening to this podcast, the Bengals did announce that Joe Burrow had a very successful surgery on Monday, and he is heading back to Cincinnati to begin his rehab. And Zach Taylor talked to the media on Monday, said he wants to be around the team as much as possible. So we'll see what that looks like for Joe Burrow, but always good news when um, everything goes as planned expected to have a full recovery for the 2024 season has, what would, you go ahead i know you're gonna say i know what you're gonna say has any nfl player ever had an unsuccessful surgery like the doctors come out whoops <laughs> i knew you were gonna say that what, what surgeon is gonna come out and say you know what that actually went terrible oh god it was his wrist what was i doing with his ankle no i <laughs> I actually, for me personally, uh, I just need to see Joe Burrow throw football again, and then everything. Yeah. I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna get back down, and and I just want to know the timeline. That's where I'm at right now. And the I thing, thought the is, timeline everybody said online, it seemed like it's not even gonna bleed into next year. No, guess- that's that's what everyone's been saying so far. But the Bengals and Joe Burrow in his camp, they have kept this so quiet because normally you hear Ian Rappaport come out and say the surgeon was John or James Andrews. El Atrache. He's a He's a popular one. And you always hear the, the doctor's name come out and everyone's like, I want to know the doctor so I could read his credentials. Um, and there's nothing. Yeah, actually. like an NFL guy. Like uh, this this guy that picked for the NFL surgery. That's ah, some bozo. <laughs> Let me see the surgeon stats. Oh, 12 successes, 13 failures. Not going to lie. I would look it up. I would definitely look it up. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so we do not know who performed the surgery, but Joe Burrow is expected to be back in Cincinnati. Don't know where he went for it, but he did not get it done in Cincinnati because he's traveling back to Cincinnati. That's all we know. Um, Whoops. I nicked nicked that ligament right off. I I don't know if he's going to ever be able to throw again. Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) No, they said successful surgery. We're fine. Yeah, I just yeah, I just want all the rehab and everything to begin, and we'll get that soon when uh, when he gets back to Cincinnati. Obviously, to be determined on on the timeline when he's going to be throwing a football game. But hopefully, everything goes smoothly. Rehab's great, and I won't even talk about a healthy training camp. Um, but uh, what's going to be up on all Bengals? I'm going to write a quick, not going to be a quick, probably a bigger article. I don't think it'll be out by the time you're listening. Nobody cares about the game. So we're moving on to a theoretical article of kind of my preliminary, my preliminary look at what, so what a quickly, what is the Bengals identity? Because I feel like the talk about them not having identity is ludicrous. Like Mm -hmm. we know what the Bengals are going to do anytime, (laughs) uh, anytime that they go onto a field an identity crisis would be they try to go a full back out there and do a, whatever. I'll get into it. But like, I don't see an identity crisis. The Bengals know who they are and we know who they are when they go out onto the field. It's just not an identity that everybody wants for them. Um, and then also what can you do to improve upon that? And like, a, like we both talked about today, there were a top five offense last year. This isn't something they need to make drastic changes to, in my opinion, but I do think there are changes that could help them. And what can you do to improve there? So I think it's going to be an article based on that, which is going to be a little bit weird because it's not as much film breakdown, but theoretical. We're into that season. We're into a weird season where, yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing that stinks though, I did those articles on like DJ Turner and Jordan Battle and Miles Murphy. It's like, I can't go back to that well. You can. <laughs> I know I can, but not yet. <laughs> you can. This would have been a great day to do the Miles Murphy article. It'd be so easy. All you have to do is hit re retweet <laughs> retweet go check on my no, I'm gonna add plays yeah retweet there's a there's a new stuff uh but great work as always make sure you go check that out all bangles you can follow mike really fun breakdowns after win or lose or the rest of the season uh video clips from all the players bangles underscore sand you can follow me at lnds patterson thank you as always for listening to it's always game day in cincinnati